And we're back in northern Minnesota up by Bemidji and goodness, it's probably been what, four or five years? We did a show together up here, Matt? Yeah, four, probably four or five years. Yeah, it's been a little while. We gotta get back. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back up here with Matt Brewer and you know, there's so many lakes. We're just gonna lake hop today. I mean, there's what, three, four, five, six, seven inches of ice, early ice. And there are so many small lakes, medium sized lakes, big lakes you can fish up here. But this is really kind of a panfish paradise up here in this part of Minnesota. And so we're gonna go out and try to explore some of these lakes and flow just for crappies. Test out a couple of fairly new lures that have been pretty hot on the market. and. Uh, yeah, and just lake hop, who knows where we'll end up by the end of the day. It's kind of early ice, there's not a lot of good reports yet. People are just starting to get out. There's hardly any tracks on the ice. And so just a fun uh, time of year to come out and fish. Then you just go right in front of your snowmobile. You know, so this is just classic early ice crappie fishing, you know, natural lakes and since there's these secondary basins, these bowls, these depressions that, you know, they might be 14 feet. In this case, you know, you're looking at 33, 35 feet at the deepest, but we're in, right now we're in about 26 feet of water. But these, these, these secondary basins just load up with crappies at early ice in a lot of cases. So we're using forward facing sonar to find them. And then we're just going hole hopping, you know, to catch them. And so, to me, that's a one-two punch that, you know, some people overlook in the sense that, you know, these forward-facing sonars can help you catch a lot of fish, especially in this type of situation. There's no better tool for finding fish. But the thing is, you got this big, long transducer. I like to use a six-inch hole, for example. You got to drill two holes side by side to get the transducer down. You've got this big, heavy, cumbersome unit. You don't want to be dragging this around from hole to hole. So a lot of times we mount it on our machine or just keep it right next to the machine. We pan, we look, especially if you have two people, you can kind of walk people in on fish and then you hole hop and go hole to hole at the Vexlar. But uh, to me, those two machines really complement each other. It's like 2D sonar and side imaging, two different things, two different worlds that when you marry them together, gives you a lot more information for finding fish. One's acting like it knows what's up. Oh, there's a good one. Nice crappie. It is, isn't it? It's nice to be back on the ice. Good huh? color. Took that bait right in the top beak. That is perfect. It's a cool thing about crappies, like everyone has different colors. Like this one has like blue flecks and that dark green. Really pretty fish. Really good shape too, wide. It's a nice fish. This is a good one. Got a good one too? Yeah, I got a good one here. Looks like a better fish. That fish is. God, these fanfish are just beautiful. People just go crazy over bluegills like this. Look at that. Just love that. Just that that big hump on the forehead and the big ear tabs. Just a tall, beautiful fish. That is just cool. Cool. And that fish, you know, that fish probably came up three feet, four feet out of the pack. Smoked it. Yep. That's the thing with these types of lures, you're just getting the fish to raise higher. And they can see it from further away. And it's like these fish, you know, there's 20 fish in a pack. And if it's a race to climb three, four feet in the water column, I feel like the big fish just win that race. Yeah. You, know, you can't go wrong fishing way up high. No. You're going to catch fewer fish, but you're going to get the nicest fish in the school if they're on. You know, we always talk in code. You call me and you say, I want to come up and catch some crappies. And I hear, I want to come up and catch some crappies 
and some giant bluegills. <laughs> so then I think of a spot that has just enough crappies for a show, but secretly <laughs> hoping we can catch some big gills. I like the way you think, man. <laughs> I like the way you think. That was a beauty. That was a beauty. You know, when you look at these basin type areas, you know, where you're looking at deeper water suspended fish, you know, a lot of times we're using what we call a search bait in the sense that we're oversizing the bait so those fish can see it from further away and you try to get the fish to raise because again, if it's a race to get up two, three feet in the water column, the fish with the biggest tail usually wins. And so you look at here, this Tika flash that we're using today, which I think might be the ultimate search lure for bluegills, especially if you tip that bottom hook, just, you know, thread a wax worm on each tine of the treble just so it doesn't come off. And then we've got the Pinhead Pro, which is a phenomenal search bait for crappies in particular. And then obviously you've got the soft plastic options where you'll go with the larger tungsten, the oversized hooks on the XL drop, and then those bigger soft plastic profiles here. This is the Jimmy XL plastic, which you can trim this down. You can trim tentacles off of this and modify it. But you know your big soft plastic profiles, your Tika flashes, your pinhead pros, you know, these fish can see it from a lot further away. And that's the whole key is, yeah, you're trying to find fish, but remember too, you're trying to fish so that the fish find you. And obviously sometimes, some days, fish aren't aggressive, they're not on, you might have to scale down, you might have to use some finesse over basins at times. But when you're looking for fish, you just can't go wrong fishing big and fishing fast. So the Bemidji area is kind of cool. I mean, we have every species of fish, but from a panfish perspective, they're like somewhere in upwards of 300 lakes within 30 miles of Bemidji. So the opportunity to chase fish is endless. And most of those lakes do have panfish in them. The beauty of it is when you have so many lakes and so many choices, a lot of people get congregated on, you know, a word of mouth bite or a bite that friends found and that leaves a lot of these other lakes like there's not another person out here today um, leaves a lot of these lakes that have trophy panfish that are small and kind of tucked away in the woods it leaves them open and if you bounce around enough you're going to run into some really really good gems around here and that's what's cool about Bemidji um, there's endless opportunities and endless choices and uh, a lot of big fish there we go. That fish slatlined me. That was cool. Got a bunch of them down there now. Oh yeah, that's what we're looking for. That is cool. That fish just rushed in. That's what I love about this. Is fish baits like this high, get above these fish and just watch when they charge. Good stuff. They are stacked in here right now. Let's get back down in here so we can get another one. They are loaded in here. I kind of knew they would be. I mean, on the on the forward-facing sonar, I mean, they were just <laughs> 10 feet of fish over here. And the whole deal is, you know, you drill a hole and you come over, and the whole thing is you hope that these fish don't move. And then, you know, that's the thing we're starting to realize too is someone just walking on this ice drilling holes sometimes these fish are sensitive to it sometimes they're not but oh yeah here they come that last fish just slack lined it oh yeah look at that love it when they dig like that <laughs> another one yeah, good enough. Good enough to put a smile on my face. Oh yeah, another crappie. I got him down here pretty good. Maybe pop another hole here. Right in the tip of the beak. Gotta love that. Those are solid. Yeah, you know, that's a perfect eating fish too. I think we're let's keep a few. That's just perfect. Alright, race is back down. Oh you got them stacked down there. I do. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of technology you're using, you know, when you attack these basins, you know, obviously you got a big chunk of real estate in some cases, you know, you might have two, three acres, you might have 20, 30 acres, but these fish roam around, there's lots of places for these fish to hide. And so even if you're using forward-facing sonar, 
it sure helps to have a you know a buddy system. You have one person pointing the transducer, and you've got the other person drilling holes, trying to get on fish, and you just take turns and just tag team the fish. But you know, when you're trying to stay on these fish, you know, probably the best case scenario is if you drill a few holes and the fish don't move. You know, but the thing is, these fish are moving all the time, and so you know, even with forward-facing sonar, you know, you're chasing, chasing, chasing. But you know, again. I like to use the forward facing sonar to find fish. There's probably no better tool for finding fish over these deep basin areas. But I like to use the Vexlar to catch it because the Vexlar is nimble, it's fast. I can go hole to hole, it's lightweight. And also too, you've got that fast response where there's no lag in the detail. And so, you know, you can really fine tune your, your display. You can sort out the size of the fish and you can read the body language and the attitude of that fish so much better because there is a delay, there's a lag time that's noticeable when you're using forward facing sonar. And so I think that's the way to use both of those tools, you know, as far as just catching the most fish possible. Yeah, another beautiful fish. Out of this deep water, even though I reeled it up slow, eyes are a little buggy. I'm gonna play safe and we are keeping fish today, so that one will be perfect to eat. Let's see if we can get a couple more. So every lake is gonna have a basin, even if the lake is perfectly round, the very center of the lake is going to be the deepest portion, and that's going to be your basin. Some lakes have strange oblong basins, some of them have secondary basins that are adjacent to the deepest portions, and sometimes those secondary basins are where the fish are going to be. If I'm looking at a map, trying to dissect it and picking a basin that I want to fish, most often I'm going to look at those secondary basins and some of those smaller basins because A, they're easier to dissect, and B, a lot of times they're not as pressured. The obvious basins are going to be your largest bowls or largest holes in the lake, and those secondary basins are going to be a little less obvious, and some of them appear even subtle at times until you get, get out and fish them. And most of these basins we're fishing 25 to 40 feet of water, um, so it's, it's typically deep water. But you might run into some lakes where the max depth is only 20 feet, and it's surrounded by 12 to 15. That 20-foot section is going to be your basin. Um, and you might have some 15 foot areas off the sides and those will be your secondary basins. You wanna look at all of them and don't discount any of them. And if you've got the time, check every basin you can because sometimes all the fish will be in one and other times they'll be mixed. Uh, some in, in one basin, some in a secondary basin and you might have to go from one to the other to find the larger fish. Oh, I love that. They are just dunking that rod tip. When they hit these bait, they hit, they hit them hard. I mean, they're just... Oh Look my, at the size Look at this. Look at this. of that gill. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> That's a tank. That is a pig. That, big that bait gill. is gone i was not expecting you, you can't even see that tika flash i mean look at that it just <laughs> when i first saw the head of this thing come underneath the hole i thought it was a bass that is good golly that's a nice fish you, you know that's my love language right big bluegill <laughs> yeah <laughs> awesome 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 that is just that is nice. Oh, that's just gorgeous. Look at that. That's a six inch hole. And look how much longer that fish is than the width of the hole. Just had that nice tall back on it. Love accidents like that. So I'm just putting a little bit of meat on there. I don't know if you have to necessarily always put meat on there. I'm just, just really gobbing up a waxworm on that bottom treble, just give a little bit of scent. I'm just gobbing it on so they can't tear it off easy. This might be a good one. Got a good one there? That fish absolutely crushed it. He hit it on the upswing too. What do you got? It's another just nice solid crappie. All right. Not a giant, but nice fish. Perfect eater. 
know, that's a perfect eater. You know, so we're using these bigger search baits. I like to use a glass tip. I feel like that's a little bit important in the sense that you want that tip just stiff enough where you can give that lure some bounce. You want that blade to, to rock on that lure. And so it's not necessarily a situation where I'm using a spring bobber so much. I, with pan fishing so often I'm using a spring bobber, but with these type of baits, go with that sanded glass tip. So this is just a dead meat rod, which has got that sanded tip, soft tip. Give that, that spoon or that Tika flash some bounce on the bottom. And one thing that I'm doing in this deeper water is I am using braided line. So this is a high-vis frost braid using six pound test, which is really thin diameter. On the bottom of it, I am putting a four pound fluorocarbon leader on the bottom. Then the other thing that I like to do on this high vis line, especially in clear water, is sometimes I'll use a longer leader and I'm just tying that with an Alberto knot, but I'll just take a Sharpie marker and just blacken that line above the fluorocarbon just to make it a little bit more invisible in some of that clear water. But that's the setup, especially over deeper water. I find that, uh, when you're using search lures or using the big stuff and you're fishing over deep water, I feel like braid can give you a little bit of an edge. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to set the hook and uh, you can just tell it's one of those. <laughs> this is one of those. Oh, ho, 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 Love seeing that mouth come up. You know, a six inch hole, when you get a big crappie in a six inch hole, that mouth just looks overextended like Love seeing that come up the hole, but that that's a really nice, really nice fish. That's you know, this is a bigger fish. It's not a giant, but uh but coming out of this deeper water, um I think we're gonna keep a few of those. And we've got a few on the ice, and this one will just be perfect. And I've still got fish down there. So I think these bigger fish, especially, um you know, it's always good to throw them back, but if you bring them up and they have any sort of stress or anything like that, it's not a big deal to take them home. And like I said, it's not a giant by any means. So that's going to be a really good eater. You know, when you look at bays and locations, like, you know, those types of spots we're fishing today, you know, where you've got a maximum depth of 30 feet of water. You know, when you start catching fish out of that deeper water, there's times where you're going to see some serious barrel trauma, which barrel trauma is when the eyes bulge out, the air bladder blows up and basically you know, you're going to kill that fish. And so the biggest thing, in my opinion, is, you know, you have to fish responsibly in the sense that if you see obvious signs of barrel trauma, you just keep the fish regardless of what depth it comes out of. And if you're in deeper than, say, 26, 27, 28 feet, that's where the, that's kind of the threshold where you start to see a lot more of it. When you start seeing fish deeper than that, you better keep every fish, okay? And so, you you know, you, you fish till you get your limit, then you go home. Probably the biggest mistake you can make is, go out in these types of locations, catch 50 fish, throw them all back, pat yourself on the back as some great conservationist, and you've got all these fish floating underneath the ice. And so there's some lakes, for example, where you've got high barrel trauma, and people are releasing all these fish, and then the ice thaws out in the spring, and people think, oh, the lake winter killed because there's so many dead fish floating up on shore. And so I think as anglers, you know, we get a, you know, we're gonna have to get a better understanding and a better grasp of that. And so I know Minnesota DNR just did a really fascinating study with angling buzz where you know, they were able to document a lot of the barrel trauma. But here's the challenging thing is that there's not an exact line. I've seen fish out of 20 feet of water that exhibited serious signs of barrel trauma. And I don't know if that fish came out of deeper water and it was caught in 20 feet and the, the fish's bladder and body couldn't adjust to that change. And then there's other times where 24, 25 feet of water and there's zero signs of barrel trauma. But it seems like for sure when you get over 30 feet, like, you know, say if you're 40 foot bays and the fish are 10 feet, 5 feet off the bottom, those fish are over 30 feet of water, almost all those fish have barrel trauma. And so that 30 to 25 foot range is kind of the zone where it's kind of an in-between zone. And so you're going to have to just use common sense in the sense that if you're seeing barrel trauma, keep those fish, you get your limit, you leave, you know, or you just leave the spot entirely if you don't want to keep fish. But uh, it's definitely something where, you know, I believe in opportunities. There's a lot of lakes where if you don't fish that deeper water, if you don't fish the bases, you're not going to catch much. Okay, and so I believe that people should be able to go out and catch fish. But at the same time, 
you know, when, the, when you have that high mortality, you keep what you need, you catch what you need, you catch your limit, and then you leave, you go home. And so that way, you know, you try to leave the least amount of impact on the resources you can.